if you want to be oh, able wow. to record. That's new. Yeah, I it know. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? <laughs> <laughs> I guess maybe maybe like uh, people were recording things without people being aware of something. <laughs> <laughs> well how, how have you been yeah all right um it's been like what 10 months or something since we last talked yeah yeah life I, is going faster um well like you know like relatively it all seems faster for sure like but... well it seems you've been through a variety of iterations and just this morning i was just going to do like you did and confirm that we were talking and i couldn't find you on twitter <laughs> oh cuz i changed cuz i changed my handle to harambe that's, yeah that's yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> then i sent you an email said are we still on and then i got busy oh, and, but um glad we could glad we can make this work well i'm i'm just curious i'm just curious you you're you're sort of fun to follow in terms of um, I mean, Christian or not Christian, and um, the philosophy seems to be the more steady part of your story. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's maybe that changes too a lot. Yeah, it it does change. Um, it, it depends on. I don't know what I what I'm looking into or the kind of things that are going on in my life. Uh, I mean, at the minute. I'm uh, working a lot in the week, so it becomes very difficult to, I don't know, I guess philosophical issues seem more kind of like frivolous in that time, but next year I'm doing, you know, like a, I'm taking a year out to do a postgraduate degree in philosophy well in three weeks time. So oh, wow. hopefully I'll have a bit more time then to um, explore some of those things independently. And then there's all the the life change things around that like moving and you know like quitting my job and stuff like that to go and do that so that's a bit of a difference so you're relocating for this for this um this degree yeah moving up to glasgow though i think half of it will probably be online you know because of um covid restrictions yeah. on lectures and things like that but um i want to i still want to make the most of the things that can be done in person like seminars and conversations and discussion groups and things yeah still still with your the other pieces of your life changed or staying the same or and bro broadly the same i mean um my career is um you know in in software i've no idea what i'll be doing after i do this uh spend spend a year doing um a year in philosophy maybe i, I mean at the minute i think if, it, if i was to make the decision right now I'd probably think, oh, I'll try working in a startup now for a year or something just to have that experience in life. But I can't say what kind of person I'll be in a year's time. Um, and I, yeah, I'm still I'm still with the same person. Um, nothing has happened in terms of like family relationships or anything like that. Or um, it all pretty much stayed the same. It's just been another set of kind of another bunch of seasons of just repeating the same sort of work week, you know, since we last talked really. And yeah. I guess my thoughts have progressed on things. Have in the UK, I mean, how financially, how do you take a year and do this degree? Do you have some kind of stipend or you go on the dole? Cause I know in the UK, it's quite different from America for those kind of things. Yeah. In terms of tuition fees uh, for a first degree at each level, so that would be like undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD would be like the three levels. You can get government funding for the tuition fees, which is okay. good. Um, and there's quite good repayment terms on that and everything, you know, versus like a normal bank loan. Um, in terms of then the financing for what you do in day-to-day -day life, undergraduate degree and medical degrees do, you can get like additional funding through um, the student loan company, but for postgraduate degrees, you tend not to. So I've not, I, but I've been working for the past five years. Okay. I didn't have any debt from my undergraduate degree because that was paid for by a company I was working for. So um, I've got enough money to support myself for that time. Which Oh, I'm super. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So you still got your YouTube channel. What, what's, what's, I mean, what, what's kind of behind your motivation for your YouTube channel? What's, is that often, I, I notice with people, well, some people do YouTube to make money and a lot of us do YouTube to have fun. <laughs> um, what, what's kind of your motivation behind your YouTube channel? I think it's a hobby. Um, it's sort of similar to my, what well, similar and different, I suppose, in a lot of ways, like to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a part of my life, right? And I enjoy 
like there's a community there i enjoy going i enjoy doing and, and my youtube channel is kind of similar for me in that there's a community of characters who will come on or pe you know people who will comment and think uh, and you have these sort of relationships with people through that um and i i think i enjoy it i mean it, i get a tiny bit of money like um maybe a hundred pounds a month through ad revenue and stuff um which is you know it's not it's not enough to live live off of or anything and it's not it's nice to have that but i don't really do it for those reasons um at all because i can't be bothered editing videos and i can't also the other thing i found out is i don't like having to like pander to an audience in a sense because then i couple myself to an ideology which is the ideology that attracted the audience to me right and yeah uh, yeah and then it's very difficult to change your mind or to or to have fun you know like when you if you want to poke fun at someone who's saying something on the same team or it becomes very difficult because you've got to play like the kingdom politics of you know keeping the audience on on board and stuff so yeah um I, i've decided i'm not playing that game with the youtube channel it's more like um i don't know i maybe i'll try i think i'll definitely want to try doing some in-person interviews um while what like when i'm at university for example with people who are on the faculty i can say well do you mind like recording um some quite like answering some questions that i've got in person and then i might put those together a bit more professionally edited but in general like the the idea of doing um professionally edited videos and stuff just kind of i i don't know it's against what i do or what i what i'm yeah yeah i i totally understand that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're kind of the same with your like you practice your sermons and stuff, and do, you know. Yeah, you'll probably find that your univers your your professors like being on YouTube. I've I've found that a lot of university professors really like being on YouTube. So, <laughs> you know, they'll probably yeah, say yeah. yes. Then they'll want more, and it'll be like, oh. <laughs> I'm not really having this channel to host you. Just you know, get your yeah. own YouTube account and learn how to use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's quite it's quite good as well because um, in Glasgow, Glasgow is quite close to Edinburgh, and so you've got kind of access to both universities then and their faculties. You know, in terms of um, if there's different subject areas or someone, you know, like a speciality person, I want to interview on something that could be quite good. But I've not I've not organised anything yet around that. But it's just an idea I've got floating of um, you know shoot, shoot someone in New Testament studies a message saying do you want to make a video about um, this question in New Testament history and then I can go over film this area yeah do it like that I, I wanted to talk to you because of course you your story you've you've and one of the things I've appreciated about what you've done is you've you've I think you've tried to be honest with YouTube like you just described about where you're at what you're thinking and obviously for me as as a pastor I even though I don't really UK is is different from the US but it's it's interesting for me listening to people sort of go through their journey and and your journey's had some pretty sharp you know you came on the radar during the whole Jordan Peterson thing you you made this video about you know he became a Christian with Jordan Peterson and if someone wants to go through our past videos you've kind of walked through the stages of disillusionment you were quite frustrated with this church that seemed rather controlling and perhaps even a bit tyrannical so then you kind of swung hard the other way and back to the atheist thing usually sort of with a, a philosophical edge and it, now it sounded like lately you're, you're sort of tempering in the middle so where 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 do you sort of stand now i think i i mean i'd say i'm i'm still in the in the middle in terms of the positions that like what I think is true of the world, mm -hmm. but there's something, um, but I would say maybe the best way of describing it to someone would be that the um, sy the symbology and the language of Christianity is a part of my psychological makeup, you know, it's, it, it's how I, um, I definitely resonate with the Christian symbols for for talking about you know the human experience and the way reality is more than i do any other cultures now i, I can't tell the difference between whether that's like um you know that whether that's a purely historical fact of like what i was just born in this area or whatever and it happens to have a christian history if i'd been born in uh, a muslim country or whatever it'd be completely different and i i don't have particularly good arguments to say you know like that that symbology or whatever is true or anything like that but but the thing that I'm still confronted with, whether or not I believe it's true or not, is that those symbols are still the way that I sort of pass up reality and think about it, you know, in terms of 
I, I suppose, morality to a degree in terms of um, my relationship to to lived experience, like how, how I should be a person in society. How, just for example, um, I don't know, like like with the recent stuff going on in Afghanistan, I've been looking on the snap map quite a lot, you know, because you can click in and, and look around all these places in the Middle East. And I, I just think but perhaps the way that people over there think about reality as a result of their different cultural and historical backgrounds is very different to the way that like I, I would think about it. And the same goes for, you know, like India or, um, well, Russia's got a different like Christian Christian sort of uh, flavor to it. But um, yeah, I can't, I, I can't say, well, these symbols are therefore true because they really appeal to me, but they still do really appeal to me. So I'm kind of um, stuck with that. And that, and if that's what, if some people are willing to sort of classify that as like a faith-based position or something, that's okay. But I mean, I also accept for a lot of people, that's not enough to, you know, to sort of bring you into the Christian camp, right? And I'm happy with that because I don't want to be disingenuous with, um, the way that I feel reality is, you know, I'm not, I'm not that convinced by many of the philosophical arguments or anything like that, or I don't, I don't see theism as that much better than atheism when it comes to like explaining why reality exists or why it's this way rather than that or anything. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm just kind of left with a description of my own kind of psychological state and I don't go much further beyond that. When, when you say, and I know this, this might sound a little weird hmm. when you say you don't know whether the symbology is true. What, what do you mean by that? Sure. Sure. So when I think of, um, when I'm thinking of truth, I'm thinking of a, like correspondence to reality. Right. So, um, say for example, I, that if I, if I think the thought, the cat is on the map, and obviously I'm expressing that to you in language, right? I'm saying the cat is on the map, but that ex is an expression of some state of affairs, which is true just in case, you know, the cat that there's like a cat there that's on the map. Um, when it comes to- And the map like, is a, is your, when you're map, saying sorry, map, you're saying, referring to a very particular physical object, same with the cat, um, as right, opposed yeah. to, let's say you open up a book and here's a picture and there's a map and there's a cat on the map. Obviously, I mean, this is pro, this is part of the difficulty with this, this whole, I don't want to throw out a correspondence frame of reference with respect to truth, but that's part of the difficulty with using that correspondence um, definition of truth. Right, sure. I, I agree there's no, um, there isn't like a place where I can stand side on and look at my um, my mental states and the world and see that the relation between them fits, right? I'm always trapped within my... So I, I when it comes to my epistemology, I'm what would be called like a coherentist really rather than a foundationalist, which is to say, but, but one of those beliefs that coheres with the other, with the others, sorry, is um, a belief that my like mental states and things do represent an external reality. Um, and that's part of the kind of systematic web that I've got, but I, I fully accept, like, I can't, I can't get at the outside world in a way. I can't, I can't like, um, you know, st stand outside and say, yeah, like the, the cat is on the mat over there. I can really see that that belief is right. Um, so that, and then that problem plagues, you know, the questions of religious belief, right? So, if I go to church and I, or, or I, I pray or meditate or something, or I read the Bible or I, wh whatever it is where I have a kind of experience that would be something that would be classed as like a religious type experience. Um, similarly, I can't do, you know, I can't stand side on and go, oh, like, that really was like um, a connection to some kind of divine realm that's over and above the material or something like that. I've got the phenomenology of the experience, but I, uh, and then the question is, then looking at that background web of beliefs right to try and figure out well what do what do i make of that experience and then there's prob problems with well psychology gives me good defeaters for the idea that it really is a, a religious experience but then there's also the fact that uh, there's the sort of what might be referred to as like the self-authenticating nature of the experience itself it's like you kind of like gaslighting yourself in a sense you know where to the point where you're doubting your you know you've got you kind of like prompting yourself to doubt your own experience and then why are you not doing that all the time so i i kind of then get left in that state of agnosticism where i'm like well i can't really say either either way because under certain models of christian theism like it's kind of expected that 
that's the way that one someone would have experiences with god and then they wouldn't be there the next moment i mean like the psalms for example are full of people saying you know where where are you god so it's it is expected under theism that it would be like that as well but then there's also a part of me that's like well i can fully account for this just in terms of like natural psychology and uh, natural explanations which doesn't you know i don't need to add anything into the story there that is actually divine and that just leaves me kind of in the middle where i'm like well i'm just i'm kind of uh I'm going to withhold my judgment, say, from connecting that experience that I can have to a, a, a particular metaphysics of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's interesting listening to you talk in, in some ways. I hear, you know, in talking to Tom Holland and listening to him sort of work through his questions about faith and, and especially the way you framed it, that, I mean, you, you, you really, I mean, it, it's so funny because when we, I, I, for years I've heard people say, well, if you were born into a Muslim country, well, would I be me? Um, you know, are you talking about, because obviously all the way back generation after generation, the symbology that I'm nested in, the, the genetics that I inherit, the, um, the epigenetics that have affected multiple generations in terms of my, my past. I mean, if, if I were born in Pakistan in 1963 instead of New Jersey in the United States in 1963, would I be me? Because once you get to the question of me, you know, all of these other things go into me being me, sure. and 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 so it's it seems almost like this little this little psychological trick we play in ourselves to imagine, well, what if I was a woman? What if I was a Pakistani? What if I was a 17th century? Um, uh, Polynesian. It's like, I have no idea what that would be because I, you know, and, and in fact, you know, I, I often reference the case that, you know, I've been married, my wife and I just, you know, we had our 33, 33rd wedding anniversary. This person that I've lived longer than I've lived with any other person in my entire life, we can still sit across the table and not, you know, understand each other, even in right. some, you know, incredibly basic levels. And if I were to just say, well, what if I were my wife? And the, the more I know my wife, the more I realize I can do that for something. Someone would say, well, what would your wife think about this? And they would probably give you a pretty good guess, but she continues to surprise me. And so this is, you know, it's all the, in, a, in a sense, to a degree, it's kind of the more you know, the more you know just how slippery this whole thing is. Yet, as I think you said very well, you're, you're still out there and you got to live. And so every day you decide, every day, you know, you have your habits, you have decisions that you make, you, you still have to choose from the set of um, the you-ism that is in order to work in the world yeah i i agree with with what you said there that i i mean i'm personally not convinced that there's like a cartesian soul or i don't know like a, a nathan essence right that can be transplanted into some other situation but i, th I think the thing the, the way it's the reason it's useful to talk about things in that way as if I'd been born in other is because you're kind of thinking well say if I kept like all of the things the same well the causal factor the thing the causal factor that makes me have this psychological experience is probably you know like those um his, historical like processes or forces or whatever the sim symbology of um Christian Britain or whatever is some somehow sort of in my psyche and it's like well keep all else the same and then just replace that with um I don't know, pa Pakistan or whatever. And you, you probably just get a person who's approximately similar, but then when they have those divine experiences, it's like, oh, you know, like uh, there's no God, but Allah and Muhammad is his uh, prophet or whatever, you know, like um, I, I think, um, I mean, I obviously I, I don't believe that and I find that implausible, but I can see how I think I, I could find that plausible in a similar sort of wishy-washy agnostic sense as I find like Christianity compelling and plausible, you know, where it's kind of there in my psychological makeup and it structures to some way, the way that I think about and engage with reality. Um, especially like particularly like morally and, and um, well, you know, like when I, when I think like what, when I think like what's a good story in some sense, like what a good story is, 
is something that's like structuring. I think it's like prescriptive. It's kind of like structuring the way that I intend to act in like certain idealized scenarios and things like that as well. And definitely like that there's an element of Christian narrative that's there in the wider culture and the stories that have affected me, but also there in my own psyche. And I, I just think that that could be different in that different situation, you know, like, um, and, and that give, and, and I think that being aware of that gives me a reason to think, um, well then, I don't know, like, like almost, I sh it's a reason to not trust those psychological um, symbols, right? As much as, as much as what else? Um, it's a reason to not trust those psychological symbols in the same way that I might trust, like, um, I don't know, ma uh, things that I reason about mathematically, right? Which stay the same across cultures, like certain necessary truths or something. But it, it seems more of a contingent thing or something. Maybe not tethered to the external world's reality in the same way. And that, so that reduces my confidence in that. Maybe that's a good way of articulating that point. Yeah, you know, even, even the whole question of confidence is a really funny thing. And I think, you know, so in, in the US now, obviously we're continuing to, to watch the, the COVID pandemic sort of swirl its way around. And, and as a pastor, I, I think California now is about 63% fully vaccinated and another 13% have, have one shot in. And just listening to people, you know, the, these questions of, see, if we say confidence and we're talking in a philosophical realm, we sort of have it over here. But if we talk about trust and we talk about decision-making and, you know, for so for a lot of people, you know, do I get the shot or do I not get the shot? And do I trust that? You know, there's been a, so much made politically in the States about, oh, oh, the Republicans don't get vaccinated. And I'm sure there's some statistics that are out there. But here in very blue California, I know a, a lot of people who uh, will never vote for a Republican in their life that aren't getting a shot <laughs> and they're not getting a shot for how many of all these different reasons. And, and, and for them, you know, if you, for most people, if you sit down and you start asking them questions, you know, one or two questions in things get pretty mushy, pretty fast. Um, and you, you start getting sort of ad hoc answers to things similar to what we might imagine we'd get for these split brain things, you know? So why don't you get the shot? Well, I don't, how do I know what's going to happen in your body? Well, there's statistics, yeah. blah, 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 blah. But uh, I mean, all of that is so, so incredibly embedded in so many layers of um, sociology and psychology and personal experience. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the crazy thing about human beings is that we're we, when we're always looking for you know in sort of the vervakian sense the relevance realization of this and that but there are just so many variables in any given human being about even the question who do you trust what do you trust what do you trust in and so i mean i think it's you know it's for this reason that you know, give any two, you know, find any two philosophers and you can almost watch them have a good conversation and the good conversation is going to happen because they very quickly find something they disagree about. <laughs> and, and the same is true for, for mathematicians, except that of course, um, there's a good bit of body that they say here, you know, here's all this algebra and calculus and basic, basic arithmetic that we have absolutely no question with, but you go out far enough and you're going to find, you know, how to quantify this stuff, at least as much disagreement about the world as this little body that they can agree upon. That's a really, that's a really astounding thing to think about when we think about what is human knowledge and how do we make decisions? It's amazing we make decisions at all. And it's certainly no wonder we make bad ones because we're, we're almost always forced out into realms of decision-making about things that we quite frankly cannot come to any certainty with. For example, 
okay, stick that, stick that Pfizer vaccine in my arm. What will happen? Well, odds are, as it was for me, it was fine. Didn't have any, but there's going to be people out there who have a terrible reaction, you know, all sorts of things. Am I one of those people? You stick the needle in, you find out. So, you know, and that's, that. so even just with that one tiny little example, I think we see a lot of the realities of human knowledge, human wisdom, and, and especially when we get to sort of a correspondence theory, because the correspondence would be, stick the needle in my arm, I'll be fine. But just even in that tiny little even in that tiny little equation, 10 years ago, will we discover that me being injected with the Pfizer vaccine caused something, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Anything works at all. It frankly is, <laughs> or that we know anything yeah. at all. Yeah. I think I, I'm in agreement with you that um, there's, a tremendous amount of complexity to like everything right and to whether whether you like zoom in to the microscopic level or you zoom out to the macroscopic level there's all these different perspectives and ways of looking at things at different scales and they have different structures and it get you know more and less complex and i i certainly can't you know contain all the facts from every perspective about any situation and then inform my uh, belief to act or live as a person based off of all of the available facts, right? And I, and I agree, I think um, that that's also built into our psychology. You know, there's really good research into the um, cognitive like biases and heuristics that we use when we're reasoning all the time, um, which can lead to us making, you know, uh, trivial like arithmetic mistakes all the way up to us making like terrible like stereotyping decisions that prejudice like whole people groups and things because that we're, to some degree there's just this kind of shortcut through the th through our psyche to do that. Um, but then I, I think whether whether my sort of commitment to there being a lot of complexity undercuts undercuts my kind of decision to try and make to to try and make commitments in certain ways that um fit with background as many background beliefs as i already have as possible or not is something so i think i can sort of i don't think there's like a contradiction maybe to put it that way between being aware that i'll never be aware of all the relevant facts and so you know maybe i even things i'm really really confident about i'm not I, I'm not saying it's like infallible or whatever. It's just like I, for given everything else that I I have a belief about, it's like a really high percentage or something. Um, and I don't think that that is like inconsistent. Then with saying that the world's really really complex. Like I don't I don't think saying that it's really really complex should kind of lead to, um, uh, so kind of anything goes. I I don't know if that's what you were, I don't think that's what you were suggesting because I don't think that's how you think or believe. But I just want to kind of r maybe rule yeah, that out, yeah. and then maybe maybe what you're trying to go for, if I is like, um, well, we have to pragmatically make decisions. So we always make decisions. I mean, to not decide is decide. I mean, the the way that life works is we make decisions of. We decide or we avoid, but decisions are made and the, you know, the, the tree goes on and life keeps pushing us forward. And, and one way or another, you, you sort of have to make commitments on good or bad information on bias or unbiases. I mean, life, life demands that, in fact, despite all of the not knowing that we have, we have to make commitments and we, we make those commitments as best we can, basically, and, and figuring out, well, how do I make those commitments? And, you know, the, in many ways, the, the, the choosing of those commitments along the way is subject to all of the fallacies and, and difficulties of life. But yet we, we run those heuristics and we make those guesses and we say, okay, I'll make this commitment. And so when, you know, when I went down to the when I went down to the place and said, 
stick it in there, baby. Um, I made a commitment. And I made the commitment to the first one. I made a commitment to the second one. We're going to do the first one. Now, if I'd gotten horribly sick after the first one, probably would have changed my mind, but I didn't. So put the second one in, baby. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't actually say that to the nurse. I think she would have been um, horribly offended if I had said that. I just walked in and <laughs> rolled up my sleeve so but if if i if i repeat back to you what i've heard then just to see if i'm get tell, tell me if i'm getting this right so like is it something like um life sort of like living life or ex just being sort of forces us into a position where we have to make decisions one way or the other yeah. but where we're also aware that we don't have enough of the relevant facts to have a particularly we might not even be aware event. of that i'm saying we right. should oh, be we might, but we yeah. probably yeah, not yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure and and that's what you're getting at it's kind of with like the vaccine or the relationship yeah. case right and and because we were talking about confidence and and confidence too is this strange so you know i know all of these people now they have no confidence in the vaccine and i okay i on one hand i i want to respect them and i understand why they have no confidence in the vaccine could be an individual thing could be a thing about their group could be some biases that they have all of these things they have no confidence about the vaccine it's just interesting to me the way that this experience of trust or confidence is formed and of course that is all subject to all of this stuff because you know i'm always dealing with lots of people who have confidence in this or no confidence in that they embrace christian faith because you know they sort of have a confidence in god and then they lose that confidence in god and so i'm i'm always what i'm always interested in is listening to people's thinking about these things and you know some people might want to jump in and try to correct people's thinking on it and i do that sometimes but for the most part i don't find that a terribly profitable thing either because the the, the matrix out of which we, we trust or don't trust, commit or don't commit, a lot of that is pre-rational. It's, it's, you know, it was via psychology, psychologists will tell you. It's not that it's, it's not accessible to disciplined, determined work if we wish to pursue it. But at sort of a naive level, it's, there's a lot going on there under the hood. And so, for example, someone who um, we might say has trust issues for all sorts of very understandable reasons, they, you know, they, they say, okay, well, I'm not going to trust. But the way life works, that decision to not trust also has, has consequences down the line, which in the United States now with the Delta variant a lot of people are getting in touch with because they decided I can't trust the medical establishment. I can't trust the evening news. I can't trust the government. And so I won't get the vaccine. And then they wind up in an ICU unit with COVID. Mm -hmm. A few of them, many of them didn't trust it, didn't get the vaccine, maybe got some case of COVID and got some natural immunity and will go on. So I'm just I'm just always interested in these questions of much more and much more than in these questions of knowledge, because I tend to think people's ideas about knowledge are a little bit post hoc to the deeper questions of trust. And I think those, those tend to be where, especially as a pastor in my work, those tend to be where I focus more of my attention because those will tend to determine much more than the ideas, what commitments they will make or won't make. And those commitments will tend to, will tend to shape how they wind up actually living their lives. Yeah, so there's a few things in there that you said. I, th I think the first thing I'd wanna say is I mean, I do, I do think that confidence is a good way of talking about, um, of talking about beliefs. And, um, I mean, I, I'm going to say the word credences, but I don't want like, um, you know, like the, how probable we think it is for something to be true. Um, because I think what that expresses and, and a good way of getting at this is if you ask someone, you know, to, to bet say on, on a certain outcome, 
um, you know, bet that God exists, bet that God doesn't exist, bet that, um, you know, the vaccine is going to make you really ill, or bet that it'll give you some immunity or something. Um, how people would kind of shift around the money on those things, I think, is a good indication of where they're at. And, and I think bringing money into it somehow helps um, it helps us to sort of like get at that, whereas just asking for like a percentage maybe isn't as good because when there's like value involved, I think we really try and think, well, ha-. but then you've got to take into account, I guess people are also thinking about the payoff there as well. So you've got to kind of eliminate the, pay- because if, if if someone's not very confident that something would happen, but there's a big payoff for it, they might be going, well, I'll still put, even if, you know, and that's not necessarily- People represent- play the lottery every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I, I do think it's a good way still of, you know, like a, a good kind of um, approximate tool of asking people, and then you can kind of get get a sense of, of how confident they are. Uh, another thing that maybe, I mean, we differ about, but it might not be worth going down the rabbit hole on, is um, I what I agreed with you. There's a lot of like um, pre pre theoretic, or did, did you say like pre uh, pre rational? I forget the exact word that you used. It's even pre conscious, right? Uh, and a lot of that stuff goes on in our in our reasoning. Reasoning is not the right way of talking about it, of course. But a lot, it's not a lot a of bad that way stuff of talking about it goes on in our processing, maybe. Yes. Um, yes. For the, for the kind of conclusions and beliefs that we form. Yeah. Um, and some of that's irrational. But I, I also think that um, offer that someone who puts themselves like me in the position of doing philosophy, for example, which is supposed to be the, um, the sort of subject where you're prizing apart these concepts, you know, like you, you kind of, you're stepping outside of the ordinary um, games that are being played through language and stuff. And you kind of, um, taking your language on a holiday, as it were, outside of the outside of the kind of city that's been built with its, you know, like here's the here's the old historical district of the, you know, these language games, the Shakespearean English and the King James. But you're taking all these concepts and things that you've inherited away from there, and you're kind of looking at them, you're teasing them apart, you're seeing how they fit together. And I don't think in that in that game, which is broadly, I think, kind of what we're doing now and having this conversation, I don't think we can um, sort of just resign ourselves to um there's some processes that are outside of our control that have caused us to believe certain things because we're trying to engage in the very process of like critic you know critically analyzing and put it you know putting them under the microscope and looking at those and things um but i i do agree that they play a part in everyone's belief formation you know including me but a large part of what i'm trying to do is like um pull, pull back the curtain on them or analyze them and assess them see how they've influenced you know, my thinking in certain direct directions and, and get under the hood there. Um, and then I'm trying to think what that, what the other thing was that you said about, um, you know, when you said knowledge, we, we kind of overrate, um, I, maybe it's in a similar vein, like we, we kind of overrate knowledge or we misconceptualize it or something. And I think that this comes out of, um, you know, like the, the Vivekian distinction between like, um, the, the three P's of knowledge or how, however he's divided up. But I think standardly, I mean, standardly in epistemology and philosophy, it, knowledge has been divided up that way for quite a long time um, between, you know, like no, no how, acquaintance knowledge, propositional knowledge, um, ability knowledge, like how to ride a bike and stuff like that. And, and, and that there has been quite a lot of thinking about, it, it's just that philosophers tend to mainly, I, I agree, mainly concern themselves with propositional knowledge and maybe a, a correct criticism would be that um, the the propositions um, the propositions lead us astray because we're that's like this tiny amount of what's actually going on. And I actually think I, I mean maybe I, I'm de- completely derailing the conversation here, but I think that th- this is actually a large part of the late Wittgenstein's critique of him of. Um, philosophy when he says you know like a picture held as captive he thinks the main problem with philosophy is that people are thinking in terms of this like um, picture theory where where language kind of points to these like essences and pictures and things like that whereas language is more like a kind of like tool that's kind of shaped and used by communities over time um, and the meaning just is the the use of, of a particular term right um, and maybe something like that is more like the criticism that you're getting at. So rather than saying, rather than the criticism being no one's drawn these definitions, the criticism is that l- trying to look for these like pictures that words represent in like propositions 
is the wrong way of going about it because that isn't really what we do or that isn't how we think or is that is that right well let, let's let's ask let's ask the question this way let's say what kind of life could we expect out of the best philosopher and philosophy in the world would they for example be more successful in in love in business in relationships would they have the best health i mean there's there's a degree in which all of this knowledge up out here that and and you're right it's something we it's something we are able to do as far as we know uniquely as human beings at least on this planet we're able to sort of take the world out here we're look at it out here we can even to a degree take ourselves out here you go to a therapist and you sit down with a therapist and um you know you you try and all of these first drafts that you've sort of that you've sort of imprinted all along you sort of take them out of you and you put them in here and the, you sit there with the therapist and you look at it and say well maybe some of these aren't working for you okay but that's a whole nother question of what, what do we mean by working but so so let's let's imagine that all of this stuff really proved itself well well you were all used to going i had, I had a friend of mine in church here who had a doctor who was terribly overweight and couldn't give up smoking. And, you know, every time my friend went into the doctor's office, she'd always chastise him on how overweight he was. He'd always just kind of look back at her like, what do you expect me to do about it? You can't do anything about yours. I'm overweight and you're not, you know, and, and so we're, we're these strange creatures that sort of take everything out and play with them over here. And, you know, have a whole bunch of self-importance about it, but all of this stuff, what all of this stuff is for supposedly is to be built back then into the, into the, the strange source of our lives where we make and hold our deep commitments, where we, um, where we govern our choices, where we, um, where we really build the rest of civilization. You know, I, I thought in New York City a while ago, um, Mayor Bloomberg, back when he was mayor, he tried to abolish large um, sodas. You know, you, you could no longer get a big gulp out of, you know, 7-Eleven, they were a convenience store. They had like a 64 ounce soda and he wanted to outlaw those. And rationally, it made a whole lot of sense because who on earth needs 64 ounces of carbonated water and sugar and a little bit of caffeine and flavor for nutrition? But, um, you know, it just was it didn't go anywhere. And but I think that's sort of a window into. Playing this game over here with knowledge is a very important thing, and, and we as a civilization with science and technology have have gained a lot i think or we th at least all sort of agree to think so that we've gained from this we have you know mrna vaccines we have ideas that you know we have some ideas about now how covid is spread and you know in many ways we're we're better off than medieval europe was during the black you know during how many plagues that went through yet at the same time um, when it comes down to how we live our lives, people, people generally don't stop and look at, oh, you teach philosophy in a university. Um, you know, you must, you must be in the best physical shape of anybody around here. You must have more money. You must have better sex. You must, uh, have, you must be building up an inheritance that our culture will, will bless you for, for ages to come. And instead, philosophers are sort of regarded as these are people who sit in a corner and talk about irrelevant things. Of course, at least that's how business people think of them and so on and so forth. So I'm not trying to sandbag your aspirations or anything no, like that because I think they're very noble. And if I had more time, I'd love to study more philosophy, but it, to me, this is just a window at getting at the question of how should we live and what is important. And I think philosophy is offers some huge tools but we don't, I mean, people sort of look at pastors as well. And, and in fact, in church traditions, you know, pastors should, they're, they should have great marriages and they should have uh, breathtaking yeah. prayer lives and they should have, you know, a pastor should be able to tell me exactly what to do with my life and then everything will go 
uh, you know, everything will turn up roses, yeah. but we found no profession in all of humanity that so far has managed to afford us this. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, maybe I would slightly, maybe I'd, I'd answer some of those sort of questions that you that you threw up a, a little bit differently to how you had in terms of what, uh, like, like, is a philosopher better equipped, for example, to deal with like a moral dilemma or something? And broadly, I think I'm in agreement with you there. Actually, I, I probably, I'd, I'd say no. Um, but then the question is, what I think maybe in the why I'd say no might be a little bit different because I think there's certain people who are philosophers who would be more equipped than the average person to deal with a lot of these questions. I think maybe the way that our kind of Western university system is structured with academic, you know, the, the way that the academic faculty is, the way, like you've got to publish and stuff in order to kind of, you know, play the safe career path. You've got to, it's a bit of a weird system. And I think it that the system itself promotes certain kind of vices, which mean that philosophers can't perform what their function should be in society. Uh, now, I think when we look to our great, I don't know, our great cultural artifacts and tokens and like the, you know, the stories we produce and stuff like that. There is our relationship there between philosophy and these things that we really, really value as like um, ways of thinking about morality, way, ways of living, um, great pieces of art and stuff. There, there's a relationship going on just as there is between religion and religious ideas, theology as well. Um, they're sort of all all interwoven to a degree. It's not it's not directly that someone reads, you know, this philosopher and it makes them do that piece of art, but it, it's all kind of that there, as you were saying, kind of un unconsciously or pretty rationally, maybe. Um, but I I think that a lot of academic philosophy is is pretty pointless, except from that which is going on maybe in philosophy of science, which might help break down some conceptual issues that there are around like answering certain scientific questions, you know, like where, well, we might be trapped in a particular way of thinking and someone needs to step outside of the subject and kind of like break down those like assumptions or something. But I, I, I would agree that a lot of loads of academic philosophy is quite, is, is quite pointless, but it, I think that that's because philosophy there's being done in the wrong way. I think that what philosophy should be is what, well, I mean, like Christianity, for example, would be a philosophy uh, and, uh, and I think that you'd find it hard to disagree with that. There's a, a whole bunch of like practices that are involved in that. It's not just, um, you know, it's it, it's not just like, um, well, as a Protestant, you sign up to all the solas or whatever, you know, um, decided on by the first Protestant Council of Geneva. But um, <laughs> but a, a little uh, little dig at the front. But um, you know, it's it, it's not. It, it's not just those things. It, it, it's more than anything, a way of kind of like living and being a person and, uh, and doing life. And I think of philosophy in that way. Um, but I also think that there's then this place for kind of like contemplating like, well, why, you know, why are we doing this every day? What do I mean when I talk about things in this particular kind of way? And, um, you know, it, it, like there's there's a room for like psychology in there where psychology is going to have a lot more to say about why it's going to have an answer to tell about why it is that I'm talking about something in a particular kind of way. And, and there's a room for um, maybe like a theological story about why I'm talking about something in a certain kind of way. There's a room for a lot of these different stories, but I think philosophy is the only one where you sort of can thread those bits together, um, you know, from those different subjects. And so for me, um, philosophy when done properly should be should be informing you know like when done properly it should be like oh that person that's doing philosophy is someone I want to talk to about this issue that I'm having but yeah I, I agree it's not it, it's not done that way like by and large and you know maybe on, on average if I have a problem it wouldn't be like yeah let's go and talk let's go to my local philosophy department at the university but I think you know maybe in an idealized society it should be something like that maybe not the university is this elitist thing but but yeah well, it's interesting because I, I was just listening to um, Rebel Wisdom had John Verveke and Evans, I forget his first name. Um, and they were and they were talking about it, that seems to be much more the the assumption, the the ancient assumption of philo, you know, love of wisdom, philosophia, um, the love of wisdom. And that seems to be much more 
it, it's interesting watching watching this sort of come around again because of course if you know even if you read let's say Plato's Republic which is probably if there's any Plato anybody's read out there it's probably Plato's Republic <laughs> where where of course Plato famously has the philosopher kings in charge of the society and you know the the golds or the silvers and the you know all the way on down um and and that of course within the within the the dialogue as a model of a human being and so then there's the you know there's the hunt for wisdom and and i think part of the benefit of you know i think part of th this this i would say was in many ways has always been sort of the assumption of what religion is and does and is for religion is there to teach us how to live and it's sort of a broad fully um it, it affords a package and, and that's often so implicit. And I think ancient, you know, philosophy was a similar way. The ancient philosophers were, were people who were trying to teach people how to live. And now sort of what happened in, ironically, the universities, which were founded by, you know, Christians in the West, um, the university system, which grew, which very much, in fact, it's quite recent, it's only since really the 19th century that universities have sort of come out from their religious moorings that that you that you have this sort of these all these abstract ideas out here and it's fascinating for me to me to watch now you know with, with Verveke and some others sort of come all the way back to sort of the ancient model where this is philosophia. This is a love of wisdom. And by, Liz, well, by wisdom, we mean something to similar to what the ancients were looking for. We're looking for guidance in order to not only live life well, but to even have some knowledge of what a good life is. And, and perhaps it's simply because in the evolution of the modern university, um, they just simply they simply coasted on a whole bunch of Christendom assumptions about what is a good life, what is truth, what is beauty, all of those things, and then did their work over here. And now perhaps we're getting to the end of it where those assumptions are no longer so broadly held that much more fundamental questions are being asked about what is good, what is true, what is beautiful. And, you know, it could be that, you know, the, the new atheist and even modern atheism has, has sort of the, the, the tail end of Christendom where people are ready to deconstruct those kinds of questions and to ask, okay, well, how will we know not just what is true in sort of a correspondence where the cat is on the mat, but a um a deeper understanding of true such as and i think in language we sort of move the words around and so we say well we want i want to live authentically that's sort of taking the idea of true and broadening it out in a sort of fuzzy way so that my authentic self um sits at the coffee shop and drinks overpriced coffee and uses their Wi-Fi to share my philosophy to the other coffee shop denizens and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, it's interesting watching this big movement. And I think we, we are at, and I think in some ways, I mean, part of the reason I'm interested in your story, I think in some ways your story illustrates some of this movement. And, and, and your story not only illustrates this movement in terms of the, the thinking that you're doing and the thinking that you're doing out loud on the internet, but also in terms of, you know, all of the stuff of your story before this um, that you've shared on the internet. And, and because those pieces of your life are also, I mean, the fact that you can go and do this, you know, postgraduate degree is because you've been working for five years and you developed a career in information technology and you've been able to, you have the discipline. I mean, you didn't, you didn't waste all your money on, on drugs and hookers over the last five years. You saved and had discipline. And Just the one time. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know a lot of people who waste all their money on drugs and hookers. So <laughs> it's not that uncommon. <laughs> so it's, it's just interesting, you know, to me to see, to watch your story evolve and to listen to you work through, because I think in many ways you like many other people in your generation and not just, I don't mean that sort of narrowly people in their twenties now, but you know, I hear it in Tom Holland, you hear it in even somebody as old as, let's say, as Jordan Peterson. It's it, broadly in this generation that there's people, and John Verveke, asking deep questions. Um, what does it mean to live a life well? What does a good life look like? And of course, there are all these, in a consumer stage, we have all these vendors out there that are willing to sell you a package. And there are religious vendors, and there are lifestyle vendors, but um, and yeah, I think philosophy is a, is, a, is a really helpful discipline to begin to address all of these things. But, you know, it's the good life is in the living of it. And how, but because, you know, time and age and the age of decay just forces us through it. It's like, okay, every, every day you have decisions to make. And th there's no stopping it and say, okay, I'm going to stop my life and figure out what a good yeah, life yeah. is. And then I'll restart it again. No, you don't get to do that. The video games. No, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I have actually th this past weekend, I, I was playing uh, a couple of video games I used to play as like a teenager. And that's uh -huh. a sort of weird experience where it's like, oh, I used to have so much time to like do this. And, uh, you know, no, I don't, but you might, you might, w one guy, I'm not sure if you've heard of who you might like about some of the things you were saying there is a guy called Don Cupid. I don't know if you're familiar. So he, he, um, he might be dead now. I called him like a year ago or something. Um, and he was really old and his eyesight had gone and stuff, but he wrote me a card, but he couldn't like see to write, but he was, um, a liberal, like a liberal theologian. So maybe, you know, you want to be careful, but, um, he, he was taken away with the ordinary language philosophy of Wittgenstein. Uh -huh. And he thought that in order to do, uh, that what theologians should do rather than sort of speculating about all these like random things is like c collect like a massive database of the way that people talk about things and analyze it to like construct a theology out of ordinary the ordinary things that like people talk about so he was saying for example at funerals um people would say well she really had a reverence for life you know she she really lived life and um, and in the past, that would have, you know, she was really pious. She really loved God. And, and he was kind of looking at the way that the the use of the language, like, um, was still, there was still like a reverence for certain things. And I think I've not read a lot of his uh, stuff, but I think the conclusion he came to was that the shift, for example, from like God talk, even though there's still some of it around in the English language, like you stub your toe, you might go, oh, Jesus is something, right? But, um, <laughs> But uh, a lot of it had, had shifted towards like a reverence for like life, for like living life in a certain yeah. way. And some of like what you were talking about, about being, you know, authentic to yourself and stuff. So, um, and I, th I think there's some validity to that, like a, a looking at, like not, not sort of imagining like going into our own head and like seeing God up there, but really looking at reality and seeing the forms of life that there are that people are living and going, well, uh, on the hypothesis that like some kind of theism or Christianity is true, right? That that's, that's reality. Now, how is God like engaging with people through that? And then I think, you know, you, you look at, you, you do like an analysis of um, the various different church movements and things like that, that there are across the world, the different ways that they live, the different concerns they have, and you construct out of that um, a theology. I, th I think that would be an interesting project, you know? Um, and I think brought like what, people in your kind of sphere are doing is something a little bit like that as well, where you kind of look, you know, look at looking more at that than maybe the traditional theology of like, um, I don't know, just like, like the armchair theorizing, right. About, about the, the concepts and things. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's a ton of value in that. Some of the stuff you said about um, the, the reasons that like secular, that things are the way they are now, say like due to, historical processes and Christianity falling out. I'm not, I guess I'm not as confident. That, I mean, that, that could be why, but I think there's other like plausible reasons there. But I, I do agree with you on the point of, um, I, you know, what, one of those, those Christian symbols that I was talking about that exist in my psychology at the start of the, the conversation. Um, 
I mean, like those would be certain aesthetic values, like, you know, the true, the good and the beautiful. Right. And I, I have like um, a desire for those things. And I, I seek them out in intellectual pursuits or, you know, in like, I, I like them in visual art. I like them in storytelling. I like them in a, a career in various ways. Like I want to be able to help people and society and things through what I do. Um, so I have an affinity for those things. And I think that they're part of like a Christian theology, right? But, but the problem for me is that um, the, there's Christian metaphysics, which will account for why that is, right? And there's also like naturalized metaphysics that will account for why that is in a different way. And I can't really, there, there's so much discourse on both sides. Um, some of which seeming plausible, some of which seeming incredibly implausible on both sides. Um, that, and I'm just kind of sat in this position where I'm like, I'm not intelligent enough. I don't have enough time, even if I had all the time in the world. And the, the questions are just too difficult to, to really like tether to like the metaphysics as it were. Yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe this is some of what you're getting at with the, well, we just have to live that way. But then I think from at least within, so I, and I think that's where I'm at as well. Like, well, I'm going to live in this way where I seek the good, the true and the beautiful, right? Regardless of what the story is behind it. But the question from within, for a lot of Christians, that isn't going to be enough, right? Because it's like, well, if you don't have the metaphysical story behind it, well, you go to hell forever. So and that's, the, that's the problem for a lot of contemporary, um, well, maybe not just contemporary, a lot, of, a lot of Christians when I talk in this way, where I'm like, well, I'm epistemically agnostic on the question, but it's still there in my psyche and kind of orders the way I live. And it's like, yeah, well, this, you know, he's not saved. He's not like, um, and I'm like, well, I, I just don't have, I mean, what, you're going to give me the minimal facts for the resurrection again or something like, uh, I mean, what's the point of, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I like the, the minimal facts story, for the but... resurrection helps encourage Christians to believe a very difficult thing to believe in at least in this frame. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. But I, but it's like, what's re what's retelling it to me in a dialectical context going to achieve? It's like, I, I so maybe I can, I can say, I really like the story. I think it's really powerful. But then I can say, well, here's, here's candidate Christian explanations. Here's the Muslim explanation. Here's the natural explanation. Uh, like, what, what do we do, you know, like beyond that? I don't, I don't see, I don't see how that's ever going to be enough to get anyone, um, there with the metaphysics at least and, and i um, doubt that people I, I think um i remember tim keller talking about and i think he was right on this talking about you know his experience of evangelism in his church he, he, he usually said once people once people want it to be true they can usually find a way of believing it and i think that's that's more often the case that um that that people see that that people want to live into this story and then they find a way to do it and i think i think that uh, applied to me as well yeah, the, the problem yeah. it, the problem is that with analyzing those stories right and the like theoretical virtues and things is that i can't in good conscience like commit myself to that that story behind reality is like true in, in that you know like it i i can kind of i can commit myself to the phenomenology of it right so the outcome's the same either way and be agnostic of it in good conscience because i because genuinely that's where i'm at and what i believe but, but i would sort of know i was lying to myself you know i'd right. be like uh it, like oh yeah i'm definitely certain I, like i can't i can't say the nicene creed for example right because i really struggle with like there's parts of it where i'm like yeah i'm really I'm on board with that part. I like that. And then there's parts of it where I'm like, oh, born of a virgin, like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think your use of conscience in that phrase is, is really interesting because it, what, what, what the question of conscience then implies is a commitment to a commitment to something. And, you know, let's say um, it's, it's interesting the kinds of things we violate our consciences for. So I, I think about all of the stuff I do with the homeless people around here. And, um, you know, the other day we, uh, I was trying, I've been trying to get some guy, 
Uh, he's a he's a good friend. I've known him for ten years, but he's a he's a hopeless he's a hopeless alcoholic. Um, he knows a ton of stuff. He worked fifteen years in mental health himself, and so he knows all the stuff. And um, and just by virtue of the situation, I got it. I got a social worker kind of lined up that might be able to connect him to certain social services. I got, and and so then the the paramedics were taking him away, and. He was worried about his thing. So, okay, I'll hold your sleeping bag for you. Okay, I'll hold some of these other kind of crappy clothes that probably when you get out, you're going to throw them away. Anyway, I'll throw them. And they had his bag of pot. Right. And I had to think, okay, I'm going to hold his bag of pot for him. Um, and, and so conscience is such an interesting thing because what my conscience is conflicted in that moment is on one hand, I don't want to be a minister that's holding, holding people's tree trucks for them for when they get out of the hospital. Hoping 21st you can get century. Clean. Oh, by the way, <laughs> glad you got ministry. all the drugs out of your system. Here's your pot. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, there's my relationship to him and a relationship of trust that I've built up for a number of years. And the last time I went through this, I told him, no, I wasn't going to hold his pot. And he stuck it in the bushes. And of course, it was gone by the time he got out and went looking for it again. But, um, you know, it's it's so interesting that the way the conscience works. And I'm, I'm not in any way trying to. I, 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 I One of the things I actually love about our present moment where people of your generation can be honest is that 30, 40, 50 years ago, at least embedded within the kinds of deep um, religious communities that I was, I think people had those, I think people had those doubts, they had those, those moments of conscience, but it was just, they all just sort of swallowed it, because in that community, you couldn't own up to it. And, and I think a healthier thing now is that, you know, you can say, yeah, I get to the virgin birth part, and it's like, do I really believe that? Am I am I really saying this in 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 good conscience? And and I think that's actually a a healthier step because it forces us to, at least it forces us to be honest, which is usually a better thing than just sort of. Sometimes there's times to swallow things and just live with it, but sometimes it's better to say, well, you know, I I wanna I wanna believe in the resurrection of the dead. Um, I at least want to believe in it. I don't know if I really do, but I want to believe in it. And the virgin birth, well, that's just sort of seems, what are they making that up because of Caesar? Um, you know, what's, what's the deal with the virgin birth thing? Did Luke just cook that thing up? And, you know, there's lots of reasons that people have. And I, I generally find, and maybe that's just a function of our moment that at least be able to say the darn thing and be honest and instead of in church terms, usually with people, church people, they're not going to say things like that because they lose status in the community. So, but, but as a pastor, I'd rather have them just say to me, I hey, have got real questions about the virgin birth. And I'll say, okay, because arguing with you isn't probably going to do anything. But I, I think that's actually part of the process by which a healthy, robust faith forms. And, and the faith you know, I've known, I've known many Christian believers who have doubts about all sorts of elements of the theological package that their particular church tradition demanded of them. Okay, that's that's not unusual, but and and this is where I think we we get into much deeper places where I can I can I can have thoughts and questions and doubts about all kinds of things. But, but at some point at a root level, the way we approach life, I, I think part of it, and actually Peterson gets at this in some really interesting ways sometimes, that do I think that to, to assert that existence in the broadest possible realm is indifferent to me is sort of a root foundational position that is going to have implications all up and down your system. But to say that somehow, somewhere, existence itself is at least something I can work with. And maybe even at some point, something that I can say pursues good and true ends kind of sets me at a posture at a very foundational level whereby I can begin to say, 
well, how, how do I move into the future now? I mean, to say it's evil, well, then I, I don't think, I don't think any, I don't think that goes too far. Neutral, uh, but good. And, and I think, you know, way down at the bottom, that's a lot of what, at least to say that this God that can be known through the revelation in the Bible and through Jesus, with all the doubts that we have, begins to saying, okay, being is good. And I'll start with that and build from there. Because I think it's important. Because if you say being is evil, I don't know how far you're going to get. If you say being is neutral, I tend to think it's going to lead to a lot of controlling and tyranny. But to say being is good, I think that sends us off on a good foot. I don't know. I don't know what you think of that. I, I don't think uh, being is evil has ever been like a, a live option for me because, I, and this is a really weird thing, but I, th I think just experientially, I find, I find the problem of good too difficult for the idea of being being evil, right? The problem that there are good experiences, but then I don't find the problem of evil as compelling as a reason against being being good, though I think it's like a, a problem for other reasons. But um, if I talk, the, the ones I would flip flop between um would be being being good and being being neutral right um and in terms of i mean, I mean my belief about what something that you said there would will flip flop as well so sometimes i'll think um well it does you know it's it, it's sort of as, as you phrased it um the idea that that at its f fundamental level um, reality is kind of indifferent. That's going to kind of ripple through your belief system, I think was the way you put it. And, you know, it'll, it'll alter all these auxiliary beliefs in a way where um, almost f fundamentally is something that it, it's kind of meaningless or it's it, it's hopeless or it's not worthwhile, th those sorts of things, like a, a general nihilism perhaps. Um, and I think some of the time, um, I'll think that, but some of the time I'll also think that that kind of gets, um, it kind of gets, that that's like one of the available like atheistic or naturalist views, right? But it's not the only available ones because there's also points of view that will sort of respond to that by saying, well, that's just a point of view that nobody has, right? Or it doesn't change it. And I think that this is even how some theists think about it. Like Richard Swinburne, he says, um, you know, if you take got out of the equation and you just had like um natural states of affairs right and, and god just didn't exist in this scenario well then like moral truths for example like it's good to do this or like it's meaningful to do something like that would just be necessarily true i don't know that i agree with swimburn there but it, it, there's at least some intelligent people who think that so it met, which leads me to think well maybe be like being being neutral <laughs> It, it can lead to nihilism, right? Um, in it, when people think about things in a certain way, it could also lead to. Um, sorry, if, it, if I don't know how loud that siren outside is coming through. Um, it could also lead. I live with to noise. A, <laughs> it, could, it could also lead to like, um, you know, a more kind of robust version of naturalism, under which some people with some psychological makeup seem to be like really, really happy. I don't just mean happy in like this. Um, frivolous like they're chasing pleasure way i mean like a really deep like um thinking well every moment is transient there'll never be this moment again they'll never it, it's all gonna at some point never exist and that makes it even more beautiful that you expect for some people uh, I, I don't know if i'd include myself in that camp but that really does uh, uh, then on the, qu the question of being being good um in, in some ways that makes sense right but th there's like this really strong Thomistic sense of like being is good um and i don't know i, I or, or like neoplatonic like the idea then of uh, well evil is just like a privation of being in some sense so like um you know to have i don't know um a, a disease of the skin well it's because the flesh isn't there in that area that it should be there's an absence of being where there should be being um i think in in some ways in some ways that makes sense to me right like um even in even tragic things are beautiful in a lot of 
ways in, in a, uh, like a, a kind of weird, weird sort of way, like really tragic things. Maybe, I don't know if the right way of phrasing that is because there's certain goods that come about that couldn't have been exhibited without that, that tragedy, right? Or I don't know if it's that there's a kind of intrinsic beauty to the, certain like tragic things that happen that's exhibited through the plight of people with those difficult circumstances. I, I don't know what it, what it is. It's not, it's not like, you know, the, the evil thing itself is like, oh, that's, so, that's so great. That's not what I'm trying to express. But I, but I do think, um, I don't know that, that being, being is good. It seems to me that, that, that problem of evil stuff, maybe it is a, a kind of issue for, for that, because it seems that, um, there are certain kinds of, it's not like a priva a tsunami, for example, it's difficult to frame that in terms of like a privation of being. It's not that there isn't like existence where there should be existence. It's that there just is existence happening and then there's like people caught up in it and they get really hurt and it, it's like tragic. And, and that seems to me to be bad. And it's not, it's difficult to reconcile with that like privation of being story. Um, I mean, I know Thomas will have like an answer because they've got an answer for everything, right? But, <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I struggle between, I, yeah. you know, like so, some of the, some of the time I am thinking, yeah, be it like being is good, like that's a metaphysical thing I can sign up to, and some of the things I'm like, well, it's just it's just neutral, right? And that better fits the way reality seems, and I, I kind of fil flip between those positions. But I I do agree that one is the more theistic position, right, and one yeah. is the the non theistic position. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. That's good. That's really helpful. I and I think you articulate well where a lot of people are at because the I, I think the prevailing, at least the the prevailing, even though the question is seldom addressed, the prevailing assumption in the academy is that being is neutral, and I think that's actually um, in ancient paganism that's probably again even though it's not asserted it's probably sort of the default posture but i think um you know via via judaism and eventually christianity the being is good and and then the question is do i do i somehow find my way to live in alignment with the good or do i buck the good and in some ways choose um, other than the good. And of course, in the Christian narrative, then things are quite reversed because at least, at least especially in the New Testament, um, you've got the present, present evil age. And so the idea is that basically that we live, we, live, we live the good even in the midst of evil and at the end, the good will, you know, the good will win. And those who have been aligned with the good eventually continue on with greater and greater goodness so that's but but there but i think you're i think you're right in terms of i think a lot of people are are sort of there on the cusp of being as good or being as neutral and i think you're right the very few i think i've met some people who would say being is evil or at least i've met some i've met some people who aspire to say that but it's a it's a tremendously difficult assumption even if implicit to actually hold and live because at some point then you know suicide or or something that's a, if being is evil i want no part of it and so i'm going to check out so no i think that's i think that's really helpful i think that's really good so well, we've been gone for an hour and a half. I don't know if you have anything you wanted to deal with me. I just wanted to check in and hear where you're yeah. at because I've I know you got I know Joey, <laughs> I know Joey banned you from the Discord and you're still maybe banned. It's, it's, every it's, it's every the couple of weeks, draw so the like hard a... line. The Christians are like, ah, <laughs> oh, let him in again. And... <laughs> no, I I mean I there was what was it that oh you, you were doing like your um atheist Q and A or something. So oh, there yeah, was a channel yeah. created, and then um there was me and one other person and i think i mean that other person ended up getting banned from my discord channel as well over <laughs> but uh, at the same time because after the banning af after we were banned on yours i was kind of like yeah i was probably a bit of a dick there right so i, I don't know i should, probably shouldn't swear on you but like i was like you know i was that 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 was a bit 
you know, sh shouldn't have been like that. And then he was kind of like, um, oh no, they, they deserve everything they get. Like it should have been even, even harsher or whatever. I was like, well, I don't, I'm not sure that that's right. And then he, he was kind of like turned on, uh, on me that it started being like that. And then. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe Joey will watch our conversation but and yeah, soften up a little bit. And the, maybe the admins will, will let well, you back in. But. There's too much like, um, there's too many time pressures and things I think and it, like discord can take so much, so much of your time oh, yeah. with, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to like cut down on the amount of time I spend, you know, on the internet and stuff, but not succeeding at all. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this was lovely. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate the fact that, that, that you're, you're still open to talk about these things. And I think you're, um, you know, I, 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 I I'm curious to see, you know, where this all goes. And it'll be interesting to see how it goes after your, um, you know, after your year of study and, and what that then points you to and, uh, and, and where this goes. Well, when, I, when I'm burning in hell with all my book knowledge and uncertainty, I, the, your beatitudes will increase in heaven as you gaze down on my air. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it works that way. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. One, one of the things, one of the things about, one of the things that Jesus says many times is that the um, participation, participation in a blessed afterlife, the, those, um, the selection of who does and who doesn't participate will be surprising um, compared to what our assumptions are here. And I think that is a, um, that, that, that might cause anxiety in some, and it might cause hope in others. And, uh, so I'll, if, if, and I, I resolve those things by basic, basically saying, if, if God is all good and God is all wise, um, then God will, then God, I'm a Calvinist, then God will make the right decisions and, uh, how he makes those decisions. I mean, how, how on earth could I how on earth could I know how such decisions could be made? And so I, I tend to be a, I tend to be a cheery Calvinist. Um, I don't know if there, I don't know if there are a lot of cheery Calvinists out there, but I'm one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, I think I think I find your Calvinism very different to a lot of the, you know, like to the Calvinism brand that you tend to come across in like the American Reformed like tradition type people, uh, like in, in the sense that that i i tend to find that calvinism is like um a series of doctrines that they're kind of signed up to whereas you seem more willing to kind of like think about theology um as almost like think about theology as like a thing that you do with people where you're working it out for yourself rather than it being like these bullet points that uh, you know like like tulip right for right? like literally a bullet like a bullet point system that you can like sign up to um so and, and i think that that's a healthy way of engaging in the discourse because it um i think the other way it then becomes very easy to identify who isn't on tulip and then they're like the other right and it, and, it, and it, things things don't go very well then um i i i would say i'm a hopeful universalist um well, I, I wouldn't even, I actually think that there's a consistent way of reading the Bible that leads, I, I, I'm a big fan of like the work David Bentley Hart's done like philosophically, um, but also um, in terms of expositing the New Testament, right? And doing like biblical theology in a way that puts all that together. And I think a lot, there's a lot of cool stuff by the church fathers on that as well. But I, I agree that it's kind of, it, any theology that anyone's going to do where they say, all I'm doing is telling you what's said in the Bible. It's kind of like underdetermined because it, it's not like there's just one, like there's the theo there's the biblical theology. Because like everyone says that they're doing biblical theology, right? And there's the, all the all the position. That's like the prerequisite of coming to the table and saying you've got a theological position is that you think the Bi like within Christianity is that you think the Bible supports it. To, uh, you know, so yeah, yeah. Well, if you if you yeah, it's. There's a lot of history to to yeah. all of that, and it's a it's a very broad history. But um, yeah, I and but again, each of us has to live out 
Um, and if, if one's a Christian, you have to live out before the eyes of God, what you think is, you know, what, what you think the truth is. And, and we all know we have our questions and our um, blind spots and our shortcomings, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I guess I inherited a lot of this from not just my tradition, which is, which is Dutch Calvinism, which is a little different from the English reformers, but also, you know, via through my father and my grandfather and through, um, you know, Christians that I've seen and was, was formed by all of my life. So, but we, we don't, we don't pick unlike what my Mormon friend says, you know, we don't pick our parents. We don't pick the time. I, I don't, God, I didn't. God picks them by his decrees. <laughs> of course he does. I, if you understand what God is, of course, God, God chose me to be the son of my parents. How else can you imagine history flowing? But um, yeah, anyway, so uh, anyway, joke, but yeah, yeah it, it was, it was lovely to talk to you again, Nathan, and I'll, I'll post this sometime this week, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely and, fine. Yeah, yeah. And again, I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really in charge of the di of the Discord oh, by choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, but I, I did want to check in with you and see how you're doing because I continue to follow you on Twitter and I, um, I continue to keep an eye on your YouTube channel and every now and then check in and see the kind of things you're doing because I, I do want. Yeah, uh, you know, again, on one on one hand, I see you as someone I can sort of track what's going on in the culture by following you. But on the other hand, too, um, you know, you've shared your story with me, and I, I really do want good things for you. So I hope your I hope your new journey through academia proves to be something that's fruitful and uh, and positive. Yeah, we'll see. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate All right. it. Take care. Uh, where's my mouse? There it is. <laughs>